relatively bulky, sterically hindered tertiary alkyl halides don't react at useful rates in the SN2 reaction, bimolecular nucleophilic substitution. However, tertiary alkyl halides do react with solvent quantities of weak nucleophiles, things like alcohols and water, in what amount to substitution reactions. And this is a process known as solvolysis, since the nucleophile is used in solvent quantities, as the solvent in very, very large excess. And it's a nucleophilic substitution because we have a nucleophile here, the oxygen and ethanol, displacing a leaving group, this bromine. Right, so this is a nucleophilic substitution reaction. However, the kinetics here differ fundamentally from the kinetics of the SN2 reaction. If we do rate studies to determine the kinetic orders of the alkyl halide and nucleophile in this reaction, we find that the rate of the reaction does not depend on the concentration of the nucleophile. This is one reason it can be used in solvent quantities, and it doesn't matter how much we use, really, because the amount of nucleophile there doesn't really affect the rate. However, the concentration of the alkyl halide does affect the rate, and the reaction is first order in alkyl halide. So unimolecular in alkyl halide, in other words, and, and zero order in nucleophile. This means that mechanistically, the rate determining step, or the slow step, involves only the alkyl halide doing something. And once the alkyl halide has done this relatively slow process, the nucleophile then gets involved in a later step in the mechanism. And so, in elucidating the mechanism in terms of electron flows, this leads us to the question, what can the alkyl halide do by itself? Well, the alkyl halide contains a good leaving group by definition, right? It's going to be a chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And that halogen atom can depart with a pair of electrons forming a halide anion in a loss of a leaving group step. And this forms the halide anion here, Br minus, and a carbocation. And when the alkyl halide is tertiary, this carbocation is relatively stable. Now, this is still a relatively disfavored step because we're going from a neutral starting material to two charged products, which is what makes it slow. But nonetheless, this can occur to a small degree. And we get a small but non negligible concentration of carbocations in these solvolysis reactions. The nucleophile gets involved after this initial loss of a leaving group step. So here's the step we saw on the last slide, loss of a leaving group. In a faster second step, the nucleophile then rapidly attacks the carbocation formed in that first slow step. This is an example of nucleophilic attack. So here we see the nucleophilic oxygen of ethanol forming a bond to the cationic center of the carbocation, which is our electrophile here. And this establishes the new carbon-oxygen bond. So at this point, we've kind of done the substitution. We have lost the leaving group in step one, and we have formed a new nucleophile carbon bond in step two. The last thing that needs to occur here to generate a neutral product is to lose a proton from the nucleophilic atom. The donation of an electron pair from the oxygen resulted in positive charge at that oxygen, and we lose that positive charge by transferring a proton here to the solvent. And the solvent is commonly shown as a base in these reactions. Deprotonation can also happen upon workup of the reaction in some cases, but in any event, as long as we use a marginally reasonable base here, we'll end up with a neutral substitution product. One thing that you'll sometimes see that I recommend avoiding is the leaving group conjugate base. Here it's Br minus acting as the base. This is actually less plausible and less reasonable than using ethanol uh, because bromide anion is a weaker base than ethanol, and we can rationalize this uh, using pKa arguments. So avoid using the leaving group as a base. Instead, use the solvent. It's also there in much greater amounts, right, because it's used as the solvent in these reactions. So its concentration, quote unquote, is huge. This overall sequence involving loss of a leaving group followed by nucleophilic attack and, if necessary, a final proton transfer step is known as unimolecular nucleophilic substitution, or the SN1 reaction for short. The SN, as usual, refers to nucleophilic substitution, substitution of one nucleophile for another, and the one refers to the unimolecular transition state of the rate determining step. So the slow step here is the first step, loss of the leaving group, and it is unimolecular. It involves just one molecule of the alkyl halide and doesn't involve the nucleophile at all. Classic mechanism here, 
the SN1 reaction. The SN1 reaction is really our first example of a multi-step mechanism in organic chemistry. And because it's multi-step, its reaction coordinate diagram looks quite a bit more complex than the one-step SN2 mechanism. Loss of the leaving group is the rate determining step, and this is universally endothermic because we're going from a neutral starting material to charged products, the carbocation and bromide anion in this case. So because this is endothermic and it's got the highest energy transition state, the activation energy for the reaction is associated with this transition state for the loss of a leaving group step. But thanks to the Hammond postulate and the fact that this reaction is endothermic, the energy of this transition state is deeply related to the energy of the carbocation intermediate that forms as a product of this first step. So the energy and stability of that carbocation intermediate is key. As the carbocation is stabilized, the transition state energy also drops and the reaction gets faster. This is why generally tertiary and resonant stabilized carbocations are involved in SN1 reactions since these carbocations are relatively stable. After the initial slow loss of a leaving group step, nucleophilic attack and proton transfer are rapid and generally exothermic. This makes the reaction exothermic overall. The leaving group is more stable than the initial nucleophile, making the reaction thermodynamically favorable overall. And the second and third steps are generally quite rapid after initial formation of the carbocation intermediate. We can compare and contrast the SN2 and SN1 reactions at this point and notice something interesting about the substitution pattern of the alkyl halide and the tendency for the SN mechanism that takes place. The SN1 reaction involves a carbocation intermediate. Because carbocations are stabilized by additional alkyl substitution, more heavily substituted alkyl halides, tertiary alkyl halides, tend to engage in SN1 reactions, while less substituted alkyl halides, which are less sterically hindered, tend to engage in SN2 substitutions as they can't form carbocations that are energetically accessible, we might say, under the reaction conditions. So for methyl and primary substrates, SN2 occurs exclusively. For tertiary substrates, SN1 occurs exclusively. And there can be some ambiguity when we get to secondary substrates. We sometimes see, for instance, a mixture of SN2 and SN1 occurring. And the, the mechanism that takes place can depend on the structure and strength of the nucleophile, as well as the solvent used.